Hello everybody, welcome back to the Insightful Thinkers Podcast. Today we're talking about psychedelics. These are drugs that up until very recently, it has been very taboo to discuss them and um, well-established uh, researchers or scientists have been afraid to even discuss their uh, potential benefits because of the way they've been uh, demonized in in culture by governments, uh, notably with Nixon, Nixon's Controlled Substances Act banning them along with other drugs during this, this war on drugs that um, his government put forth. So, but it's a topic that now is getting a lot of um, well-deserved research into possible benefits and um, and what it does in the mind and in the brain and how we may be able to use these for our benefit as a society. So, first of all, what are psychedelics? So, the term comes from the Greek word uh, that means mind manifesting. And uh, it was coined in 1956 by the psychiatrist Humphrey Osmond and to describe drugs like LSD, psilocybin, and other drugs that produce radical changes in consciousness. So psychedelics, um, they really alter your mental state and it is <laughs> totally far-fetched from what you experience on a, on a daily basis. And um, these significant effects are, are likely part of the reason why people have been so hesitant to allow people to use them for any purposes, even if it's therapeutic, because it's such a, a shift in mental state when you consume even small amounts of these drugs. But are these drugs dangerous? It, should we be weary of consuming these things? Well, um, it's virtually impossible to die from an overdose of LSD or psilocybin, and neither drug is addictive. And these are two of the main psychedelic uh, drugs. This is from Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind. This is one of the uh, premier books in this field, and he discusses uh, psychedelics, the effects on the mind, the research that's happening right now um, in neuroscience and in psychotherapy and, and all sorts of things like this. So a lot of what you're going to be hearing today is from that book, How to Change Your Mind, Michael Pollan, and also from Aldous Huxley's The Doors of Perception. This is a 1954 book by the famous, uh, I believe, British writer Aldous Huxley, who had his own personal experience on uh, mescaline, which is a psychedelic drug, and he reports what happened with his experience and um, shares his ideas about it and uh, talks about some of the hypocrisy, perhaps in the West, of why we're so afraid to try those types of mind-altering drugs but are so willing to try other harmful drugs like alcohol and things like this. So these are the two books that really um, allow me to, to synthesize this episode so that we're going to be referring to a lot of things from these. Um, now, a study by uh, a Nut 2012 uh, says, after trying psychedelics one time, animals will not seek a second dose and repeated use by people robs the drugs of their effect. So these drugs do not seem to be addictive in any way, and they do not seem to be dangerous in any way. That's not to say there's not a possibility of what's called a bad trip, which is when, um, well, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory, but when you consume these drugs, you experience uh, very difficult thoughts and very oftentimes frightening thoughts. And, but overall, um, as Pollan says, since the revival of sanctioned psychedelic research beginning in the 90s, nearly a thousand volunteers have been dosed and not a single adverse event has ever been reported. And this is from Michael Pollan's review of the literature. Now, when should you be careful trying these drugs? Because if something can have such a significant change on your mental state, then it probably isn't for everybody. And that has to be conceded. And and uh, you are at risk if you have a family history or predisposition to mental illness. Okay, so 
the frightening experience that you may have on a drug in these bad trips or difficult trips, as uh, some psychedelic guides call them, um, it can snap you into psychosis. If you have this predisposition to mental illness, you, you experience mental illness already, or you have a family history or things like this, you, it's probably not something to try because it's such an extreme uh, shift in, in consciousness. Now, a lot of surveys say that these bad trips that happen, they're very real and they can be one of the most challenging experiences of a lifetime. So even if you don't have a predisposition to mental illness or a family history, you still might want to be weary of trying these things because it can be extremely frightening and very challenging as, as people say when they were surveyed in the research. But there is a, a certain thing that can mit mitigate these effects. This is set and setting. Um, this was a term made use of early psychedelic researchers such as Al Hubbard. And I believe he coined this term. The set is your mindset and your expectations you bring to the experience. And the setting is the outward circumstance in which it takes place. So if you can modulate these things to your advantage and have a positive mindset going in rather than a fearful mindset that has been created through all of the years of, of fear mongering by governments. If you can break away from that and have a positive mindset and you have a positive setting, which may include a, um, a guide, which Michael Pollan used when he, he actually had a few psychedelic experiences in writing this book. And this isn't just some, some average Joe, this guy is a well-established journalist and he's written a lot of um, very uh, incredible books on nutrition and food is what he has done for many years. And this was quite the departure from that he mentions, but he became very interested in this topic and he, he said he likes to get very invested in the topic that he's writing about. So he actually um, took psychedelics himself, I believe on three or four separate occasions in writing this book to really get a full understanding of what these things do. And he used this, this guide, a guide is a person who kind of, um, controls the, the area in which, in which your body is while you kind of, your mind goes, goes basically, um, goes haywire a little bit and they just uh, assure you that they'll be here and you're going to be okay. And that allows you to just uh, release your mind and to um, accept the experience as it comes rather than being fearful of, oh no, where am I? Or uh, am I going to be okay? Is someone going to call the doctor? And that's what the guide does. The guide is there to, to give you that sense of security as you go on these mind bending trips. So set and setting are very important. So if you can have two of these factors, then um, it'll be really beneficial for you. What are the effects of psychedelics on the mind? I've talked kind of generally so far about these mind altering experiences, but what are some, some people's experience on it? And I'm gonna report uh, a couple of these experiences uh, one by Michael Pollan and one by Aldous Huxley. And we'll kind of use some quotes from their experience to kind of give you a better idea of what these drugs do. But to first understand how, um, how much these things can change your mind, we have to first understand what, what the sober perception of reality is like. So, um, the Cambridge philosopher, Dr. C.D. Broad, he says, the function of the brain and nervous system is eliminative and not productive. The function is to protect us from being overwhelmed and confused by this mass of largely useless and irrelevant knowledge by shutting out most of what we should otherwise perceive or remember at any moment and leaving only that very small and special selection, which is likely to be practically useful. In the first episode of the Insightful Thinkers podcast, these were a lot of things that uh, we talked about from uh, the consciousness and its various forms. We talk about how uh, 
what we perceive of the world around us is not necessarily some objective reality. This is the way that our mind constructs the reality for the purposes of survival. Our brain is more reductive than it is productive, as Dr. Broad says here. So when we take psychedelics, what happens is that this reductiveness almost goes away and all the stimuli around us become aware to us. And we'll talk about how this happens, what is happening to create this. And it actually comes down to a brain region called the default mode network, the DMN. And it seems to be the filtration system that allows us to perceive reality in this very sober way uh, as we go about our lives. But when the activity in that brain area becomes reduced, the filtration system is gone and we start to see all sorts of crazy stuff. So we'll talk about that later. We'll talk about the neuroscience of it all. Um, but let's continue talking about the sober mind and what is the nature of the mind that we live with on a day-to-day -day basis. So Aldous Huxley in the doors of perception, um, he talks about, he talks about this as well. He actually quoted Dr. Broad and then his response to, to this is insofar as we are animals, our business is at all costs to survive, to make biological survival possible. The mind has to be funneled through the reducing valve of the brain and nervous system. What comes out at the other end is a measly trickle of the kind of consciousness, which will help us to stay alive on the surface of this particular planet. Very similar things to what Dr. Broad said, and just the idea that the brain is more of a reducing valve than anything. It doesn't, it, it is not selected to create all sorts of superfluous uh, stimuli that don't help us to survive. Um, it is created so that, we, or it is, it has uh, evolved over time and, and the adaptations that, uh, came into play were adaptations that were more conducive to survival because if adaptations came in that were less conducive to survival that individual got wiped out of the population and could not spread his his or her genes to the next generation this is the idea of how these adaptations work and this is why the brain has become more of a reducing mechanism than in than a producing mechanism, again, from Dr. Broad. So we have to understand that. We have to understand that our consciousness is not the be all and end all. And we, we talked about that in, in episode one. You can refer back to that because that's where the entire article and my thoughts about that are, but we're not going to be redundant. Um, we're gonna just continue with uh, talking about psychedelics and the discussion about this. William James, the essentially the father of American philosophy, he ventured into this <clears throat> subject a little bit, although he never tried psychedelics, as apparently he was too afraid, as Michael Pollan said. But either way, he did do a lot of research on this topic and a lot of reading, if anything. And he says, our everyday waking consciousness is but one special type of consciousness parted from it by the filmiest of screens there lie potential forms of consciousness entirely different three quotes there to just illustrate this fact of of the brain of our consciousness as being incredibly subjective and it can be quite easily modulated as we'll see with with the effects of psychedelics so um now we've discussed what the sober mind is like. What happens when we're on psychedelics? Well, the best way to demonstrate this is through uh, a few subjective experiences of psychedelics and, and what these individuals experienced when they were under the influence of these drugs, uh, namely Aldous Huxley's experience and Michael, Michael Pollan's experience from the book. We'll discuss what happened with them so you guys can get a better picture of what happens when you take psychedelics william james again says what happens when you're on psychedelics is that there's some noetic quality to it so the noetic quality is some mystical state triggered by psychedelics um, which registers not only as a feeling, but as a state of knowledge. People emerge with the enduring conviction that important truths have been revealed to them. So we they don't just leave these experiences with, with a feeling and all oh, that felt good, but they almost leave, and I hesitate to use this term because it's been so 
abused in a lot of fields, but they almost feel enlightened. Okay. And they come out with this state of a newfound knowledge and a newfound understanding of things. It's more of a long lasting thing rather than just a pleasurable experience. And often it's far from pleasurable. It's the total opposite. It's completely terrifying. So, um, but this is, uh, just to say that it's, it's, it has nothing to do with just, uh, wanting to feel good or, or whatever. It really conveys some kind of a deep meaning when, when you take these drugs, apparently. And Aldous Huxley's experience in 1953 kind of illustrates this and illustrates the extent to which the mind changes under the influence of these drugs. He says, space was still there, but it had lost its predominance. The mind was primarily concerned not with measures and locations, but with being and meaning. And along with indifference to space, there went an even more complete indifference to time. There seems to be plenty of it, was all I would answer when the investigator asked me to say what I felt about time. Plenty of it, but exactly how much was entirely irrelevant. I could, of course, have looked at my watch, but my watch, I knew, was in another universe. So... Think about the sober mind, how it contrasts with the effects on psychedelics. Time is pretty much is everything. Time is money. Time is all important in our daily lives. When you take this drug, you're not even in that same realm. And it's so hard to communicate what actually happens on these drugs. And and we'll talk about that in a second, how a lot of how Michael Pollan and, and people say that it's almost impossible to communicate what you actually feel, because how can you explain what it feels like not to, for instance, in the case of Aldous Huxley, care about time or even feel like time is an important dimension? There seems to be plenty of it is all he could muster. Um, this is incredibly interesting. And Huxley also talks about how there seems to be some kind of a, a an importance of the psychedelic experience to go along with William James's noetic quality that he talks about. He said Huxley says the mescaline experience is to be shaken out of the ruts of ordinary perception, to be shown for a few timeless hours the outer and inner world, not as they appear to an animal obsessed with survival or to a human being obsessed with words and notions. It allows you to escape from this. It totally shifts your your way of thinking at least for those few hours as he says and perhaps in the long term as we'll we'll come to find out with the research on therapy using these drugs and it really shakes you out of your day-to-day perceptions and that's the importance of it is kind of what huxley is saying let's go to michael pollan's trip experience so he had a experience of, uh, I guess, similar to Huxley's in some ways, but what I'll do is I'll just read it out here. Um, because that's the best way to convey it. And this is how he conveyed it in the book, how to change your mind. This is Michael Pollan. I had not the experience of ego dissolution, but the dissolution of everything of my body, of any kind of perceiving consciousness of material reality, it was all gone. It was just a pure category five storm of energy, and I didn't know where I was in it. I felt like I was in the middle of an atomic blast or in a world before the Big Bang, when there was only energy and not yet matter. These are metaphors that don't begin to capture how horrifying it was. I thought this could be death. This could be what it's like to leave your body, because I had lost my body. (laughs) So, (laughs) this is not for the faint of heart, because... Look how horrifying he says this experience was where he can hardly even explain it because it feels as if he has left his own body when he takes this substance. And I believe this was on DMT. And uh, he experiences this thing called ego dissolution. Your ego is essentially what makes me feel like I'm me and you feel like you're you. When this goes away you can hardly even tell the boundaries between yourself and uh, and the things all around you. Um, and building from, from this idea about um, 
how it's so incredible that it's hard to communicate the experience is the researcher Bill Richards. And he says, um, you have to imagine a caveman transported into the middle of Manhattan. He sees buses, cell phones, skyscrapers, airplanes, then zap him back into his cave. What does he say about the experience? It was big. It was impressive. It was loud. He just doesn't have the vocabulary for skyscraper, elevator, or cell phone. Maybe he has an intuitive sense there was some sort of significance or order to the scene. But there are words we need that don't yet exist. There are words, there are no words to describe these experiences, you guys. And incredible writers like Paul and like uh, Huxley try to communicate these and they do in a very eloquent way. But just reading these words and you guys hearing these experiences, I don't think anybody is going to actually be able to understand the extent to which your mind is altered in these times. But either way, I wanted to try to take the best quotes that I could find of what happens on these drugs and um, share them with you guys, because I find it very interesting how much your perception of the world can change simply due to uh, chemicals in your brain. And we'll talk about uh, how we, we'll talk about that now. As a matter of fact, let's talk about why psychedelics have these effects. Why, how is it that fungi like the, the psilocybin mushroom or plants like the, um, I believe it's the peyote cactus where mescaline comes from or, uh, or, or DMT, uh, I can't remember where, where DMT comes from, but plants and fungi, um, how did they evolve the ability to produce a chemical compound so closely related to the to serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter used in our brain uh, for communication between, between neurons, that they can hijack the nervous system of the mammalian brain to produce such mystifying experiences? How can a plant, how can a fungus change my mind. I have almost no, uh, hardly any connection and biological connection in any way to these organisms. Why is it affecting me? Well, it, right now there's a lot of speculation as to why these plants evolved, uh, plants and fungi evolved these mind altering effects on, on people. And the jury is still out and the research it had been halted for a long time as they were uh, made illegal, but only recently our government starting to refund these these uh, these studies because they do seem to have long lasting effects uh, for people with addiction, depression, anxiety, and all sorts of these things. And a lot of labs in Imperial College London, Dr. Robert Carhart Harris and his colleagues are are on the forefront of this and studying how it relates to. Uh, psychotherapy and how they can be used as a tool. Um, but, but so all this to say that, uh, research has been halted for a while on psychedelics. So there's a lot of things that we don't know about them still, and we're still learning, learning about. So we don't, we actually don't really understand why this is the case, but it, there is some speculation that, um, strains of a species that produced more rather than less psilocybin, uh, and psilocin would tend to be favored and would gradually become more widespread. Why? Well, not only humans, but also animals seem to have a taste for altered states of consciousness, perhaps. Many animals like horses, cattle, and dogs are known to eat psych uh, psilocybin mushrooms. Um, so perhaps it's the case that if, if you were, for instance, a plant that produced these things that... Uh, organisms, other organisms would like to feed on, then when they ingest these things, the more they ingest these things, the more they can disperse, um, your, your, your species and, uh, through their excretion. And then your, your species grows, uh, more in a more widespread way. So this would be like a selective advantage for strains that produced more, psilocybin and chemicals like this if animals enjoyed it and harvested them like humans have been doing for a long time and perhaps uh if if these plants had less of this um this chemical then they wouldn't have been harvested as much and the more 
chemical they had, the more they would have been harvested, the more they would have been fed on, then the more they would have dispersed. But this is just all in its infancy. As, and Paulin mentions, mentions this. And in reality, there's only speculation as to exactly how psychedelics evolved to possess such mind-altering effects. So um, <laughs> as someone who is a, a proponent of science and who enjoys science, to say the least, um, it's all. It's never easy to report kind of like a uh, the jury is still out and a speculative thing. I don't very much enjoy re reporting these speculative things, but that's just where psychedelics are at the moment. And that's we're going to have to continue to do research on um, what uh, what their effects are and what is this evolutionary history that allowed these plants to produce these effects on the human mind and the, the animal mind. What are the effects on the brain? We talked about it a little bit in terms of the default mode network. Um, let's discuss it more in depth here. So in the brain, we have different neural areas. And in the normal state, these various areas communicate mostly to one another. And this is kind of a way we are able to distinguish the different brain areas, like the visual cortex. It responds a lot to sights and stimulus from the eyes, whereas the temporal lobes, there's, they're involved with memory and they're involved with hearing. And we're able to distinguish uh, these regions based on the way they communicate with one another and things like this. But when the brain operates under the influence of psilocybin and psychedelics, thousands of new connections form linking various brain regions that typically do not exchange as much information. So if you almost want to, I'm sorry for the people who are listening right now, but if you want to kind of put your uh, fists together like this, if you're watching on YouTube, um, I have kind of my knuckles together and the, your fists are separate still, even though they're pressing together. Um, and there are some interconnections between these uh, these two, imagine if this was the brain, there are still some interconnections between these areas, but when you, it seems that when you take uh, psychedelics, what happens is that you can now clasp your hands together as if you were praying, <laughs> as if the two areas of the brain are now communicating more greatly with one another. More connections are formed and it's not so drastic. Okay. Your brain is, is, it's not going to be that drastic, but there are so many new connections that form um, from between regions that typically do not communicate as much in the sober state. So thoughts and feelings, for instance, from the subconscious mind um, become crosswired with the visual cortex all of a sudden. So now you're almost seeing uh, feelings and you're feeling colors. And this is this synesthesia that it's called that, um, these the establishment of these new linkages across brain systems this is what they produce it's called synesthesia where sense information gets cross-wired so that colors become sounds or sounds become feelings and it completely is scrambling the way your brain normally can distinguish a feeling from uh, uh, a sight or a feeling from a sound or a color um, from a sound and things like this. So there's a serious cross wiring that's happening here and uh, an increasing communication of information between brain areas. We talked about the default mode network and how it's perhaps implicated a little bit in this. And what the default mode work, default mode network especially is implicated in is in something called ego dissolution that Michael Pollan mentioned in his DMT experience that we discussed. And what is ego dissolution? So what a couple participants in a couple studies said was, um, I existed only as an idea or a concept, or I didn't know where I ended and where my surroundings began. The thing that distinguishes myself from the environment, and this is me, and that's the camera, and this is the microphone, and these are all separate. When you're on these psychedelics, you are all, everything is one. <laughs> and you might have perhaps heard maybe hippies say they feel some oneness or things like this. And these are perhaps influenced by the use of like LSD and things like this, which was popular in the 60s. And um, Aldous Huxley talks about this in Doors of Perception. 
he says in his trip experience, he says the legs, for example, of that chair, how miraculous their tubularity, how supernatural their polished smoothness. I spent several minutes, or was it several centuries, not merely gazing at those bamboo legs, but actually being them. When, when you look at the legs of a chair, usually, I mean, that's the chair, this is me, but on under the influence of these drugs, you be, can pr- almost become those bamboo legs of the chair, as Huxley says, and there's some kind of a oneness, and um, for better or for worse, but uh, it's just to show how much, how markedly different the effects of um, how markedly different your your mind is on these drugs compared to when you just are living in the you're with your regular sober mind. Um, now the de- so we talked about ego dissolution. So this is the ego dissolution, and I said I was going to talk about how the default mode network um, creates this ego dissolution, or at least what's happening in the default mode network, I should say, to create this ego dissolution when you take psychedelics. So the default mode network in the brain, it operates as a filter charged with accepting only the information necessary for survival functions that we talked about at the start of the episode. Um, Now, with reduced activity in this filtration system, the D- the DMN, an overload of information now comes into the mind. There's no more filter to uh, break things down and um, allow you and and make it more easy to survive and live on a day to day basis. That filtration system disappears, and um, evidence to kind of show how much the default mode network what network excuse me is implicated in. Um, in 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 the mind and in uh in the way psychedelics change your mind is the more precipitous the drop off in blood flow and oxygen consumption in the default mode network the more likely a volunteer is to report a loss of a sense of self so the default mode network really is implicated in you feeling as if you are yourself and maintaining this um this Uh, your ego and keeping it intact and feeling like you are you when we have reduced activity in the default mode network the filter disappears and you are no longer you and you may very well be those bamboo legs of the chair that huxley talks about um all of this is is really cool but do psychedelics actually have a have a purpose is it worth discussing these things is it worth using these things is it worth reintroducing these things back into society well answers are starting to show up in research that uh yes it might be worth it to to use these drugs in at least some cases so let's talk about psychedelics in therapy well individuals with addiction obsessions eating disorders and depression stand to benefit from the ability of psychedelics to disrupt stereotype patterns of thought and behavior by disintegrating the patterns of neural activity upon which they rest. When you are in these uh, addictive cycles and these obsessive uh, compulsive cycles and you have these disorders, your mind is almost stuck in a rut and these anxious cycles, it's hard to think in any other way. When you take psychedelics, it totally is changing these ruts in your mind and it's really readjusting your perception at least for that moment and it seems that these adjustments in perception can completely shift the way you think about things uh into the future when your brain is totally communicating in a different way and it, and is causing you to have very different experiences even once that can be significant enough to change the brain um for the future and what your brain experiences whether it's um a concussion or whether it's like uh, the psychedelic journey your brain is changing at least very slightly even if it was just a, a quick moment and these changes can persist so when we talk about these individuals with addiction and obsessions and or when dr robert carhart harris talks about it because this is uh from his lab um it seems that these individuals can almost shake free of this this addiction that's grabbing them 
just due to these these psychedelic journeys that really change the way they they could be thinking about things and they come out with this noetic quality that william james talks about of um they really come out with some sort of a knowledge and a newfound outlook on the world not just a cool feeling oh that was cool but a, an actual knowledge and maybe they can use this knowledge to to change something um michael pollan mentions Mendel Kalin, this is another researcher in Dr. Robert, Robert Carhart Harris's lab at Imperial College London. And this researcher puts it in an incredible way. And I'll, I'll quote straight uh, from this researcher. Think of the brain as a hill covered in snow and thoughts as sleds gliding down that hill. As one sled after another goes down the hill, a small number of main trails will appear in the snow. And every time a new sled goes down, it will be drawn into the pre-existing trails, almost like a magnet. Those main trails represent the most well-traveled neural connections in your brain, many of them passing through the default mode network. In time, it becomes more and more difficult to glide down the hill on any other path or in a different direction. So this is what's happening when you get into these ruts with anxious or depressed thoughts. You constantly think of the same things. And the pathways that are actually um, activated when you think about these things, they're actually getting stronger and stronger the more you think about these things. And this is um, actually from a principle from the pioneering neuroscientist Donald Hebb, who says neurons that fire together wire together. And essentially... Overall, this just means that uh, the more a neuron fires, the more it's going to wire up with other neurons that fire in a like, uh, like-minded way, I guess you could say. And pathways essentially get strengthened the more they are being used, is essentially what this mechanism is. So when you constantly have these thoughts and these negative thoughts, you continue to think that way. And it becomes very, very habitual, kind of like these ruts in the snow that Kalen talks about. Um, now, think of psych. the researcher continues, think of psychedelics as a temporary flattening of the snow. The deeply worn trails disappear, and suddenly the sled can go in other directions, exploring new landscapes and literally creating new pathways. When the snow is freshest, the mind is most impressionable and the slightest nudge can powerfully influence its future course. When you take these psychedelics, if you're having issues with this, it can really change the course of these thoughts because of this rewiring. The snow becomes fresh, and it nudges you in a new direction to think in a different way. Again, guys, this is not to say that these are going to be the solution to everybody's problems, but research, there's actual research from well-established researchers and, and universities that are showing, hey, these things could have a beneficial effect. And it's just like this snow metaphor. It It is almost resetting your system. It's shocking your system. And it's you're coming out of it with some kind of a knowledge. And what is this? knowledge coming from it's coming because your brain was changed at least in a way from these psychedelic experiences and uh aldous huxley talks about how um you can come out with 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 this uh this flattened snow and a new kind of perception um a, a different way of looking at the world he he says frankly he says the man who comes back through the door in the wall uh, which is uh, the psychedelic journey will never be quite the same as the man who went out he'll be wiser but less arrogant um happier but less self-satisfied humbler in acknowledging his ignorance yet better equipped to understand the unfathomable mystery which he tries forever vainly to comprehend it reduces this this uh, level of arrogance that um, a lot of individuals have about or the know-it-alls or the people who think uh, the dogmatic people who think their way of looking at the world is the correct way and, and they seem to be a master of their environment uh, you know but psychedelics kind of uh, wipe that off the table and say there's more than meets the eye when it comes to this world around you and Huxley says, just this, this experience could be humbling in a way, and it could reduce your arrogance that you go about with in, in normal life. Um, 
We'll finish this episode with a little bit of Huxley's discussion on the hypocrisy of the Western civilized culture uh, from the doors of perception. And he just, uh, he, he was essentially ahead of his time here. This was 1954, and his mescaline experience was in 1953, I believe. And he just talks about how it's just so interesting that we demonize certain drugs like this. And even um, at the site of an episode like this, some might, people might bat an eye and say, oh my gosh, what what is he talking about? And what psychedelics is a legal thing, you know? And it's very taboo. Why have we created this this issue that's only just now starting to dissolve and this film and this uh this cage that psychedelic uh research and psychedelic experience was in is just starting to become unlocked um because back in uh, back in huxley's time this it was the case that um drugs such as these were, were completely demonized and the hypocritical nature of this is conveyed in, in this quote. He says in his book, there's a quote. He actually doesn't say where the quote is from. And I actually couldn't find where this is from. But there's a quote that says, Lo, the poor Indian, whose untortured, untutored mind, excuse me, clothes him in front, but leaves him bare behind. And this is the idea of these Westerners that, oh, the uncivilized people, uh, what are they doing? Their their minds are so... Uh, so undeveloped so uh they're so uncivilized they're savages this is the idea from with a lot of people and the these um well indians in this case but it's native americans these native americans have been using dmt and ayahuasca for many many years um and but western civilization looks down upon them and we demonize these things and we say oh that's for the untutored mind but huxley says it's actually we the rich and highly educated whites who have left ourselves bare behind we cover our, our interior nakedness with some philosophy christian marxian freudo cyclist but abaft we remain uncovered at the mercy of all the winds of circumstance the poor indian on the other hand he had the wit to protect his rear by supplementing the fig leaf of a theology with the breech cloth of transcendental experience who could put it like <laughs> like a writer like huxley man that is just um the way he puts that is just uh incredibly eloquent incredibly well written about how um maybe it's actually western civilization who is leaving themselves bare and maybe we should explore the depths of our mind before we try to judge the minds of others and say that oh their minds are untutored and uh, they're left bare and uh but he's just arguing for the fact that you know what maybe we are incorrectly demonizing these things and it might show us a thing or two if we allow ourselves to succumb to this transcendental experience um, that the natives have been going through for years now. And he, Huxley also talks about this idea of how we condemn the use of certain drugs and not others. He says most of these modifiers of consciousness cannot now be taken except under doctor's orders uh, or else illegally and at considerable risk. For unrestricted use, the West has permitted only alcohol and tobacco. All doors in the wall are labeled dope, and their unauthorized takers are fiends. These doors uh, of perception that he talks about, these doors in the wall that allow you to um, open open up a newfound uh, conscious experience are blocked off. And if you use them, you're a fiend and you're an addict. And um, But oh, take as much alcohol as need be because... Um, this is permitted and forget all the deleterious effects alcohol has it's accepted but something like this that allows you to just change your mind for even a moment in time are, are completely demonized and he says that is that seems to be very hypocritical that we and very uh, problematic the way we condemn the use of certain drugs but not others and finally he kind of discusses a lack of a will a lack of willingness of professionals um to try these drugs he says do we see respectable psychologists philosophers and clergymen boldly descending into those odd and sometimes malodorous wells at the bottom of which truth sits no 
How many philosophers, how many theologians, how many professional educators have had the curiosity to open the, open this door in the wall? None. Um, this is going to end the Insightful Thinkers podcast talking about psychedelics today, guys. And the idea that um, maybe we should open our minds a little bit. Open our mind to the possibility of a door in perception. And um, Huxley certainly comments on this. And he has his ideas about um, about how individuals are so hesitant to try these things. And as we mentioned in the episode, for good reason in a lot of ways, it can be an, a terrifying experience. It can be very difficult, but it really can be enlightening. And it can bring something to your mind that... Um, I won't say that you've been missing, but it can bring something new. And, uh, and this, I think, is, uh, is greatly communicated by Huxley, is greatly communicated by Michael Pollan. And uh, that's where I, I want to stop it today. Um, this is not... I don't even, this is not um, some, I'm not trying to suggest anybody take these things. I just wanted to uh, discuss it today and discuss how markedly changed our, our, our consciousness can be if we let it and how meaningful it can be in the end, guys. Um, thank you for listening in. We're on episode 10 now and uh, many more to come. We're going to weekly episodes this is the first installment of these monday mornings trying to start the week off right trying to get up early and and get the episode going and uh hopefully uh i can you guys can listen in uh, to start your week as well if you like this episode uh please tell at least one person about it who would be interested in psychedelics uh, even if you don't know anyone who's interested in psychedelics, uh, even if they're interested in drugs or if they're interested in consciousness or uh, the mind, the brain, share with what your best friend or or uh, or somebody else. Um, you can subscribe as well to this podcast on whatever platform you're listening on. So whether it's Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or YouTube. And um, if you're on Apple Podcasts, you can leave a rating and a review. You can just click the star rating. Um, or you can leave a review. And YouTube allows you to like the video or dislike it if you did not like what you heard today. You can share your own ideas or questions from the Connect page on the website. Or in the YouTube comment section, excuse me. And if you are on the website, uh, check out the blog posts for poems and other articles. Um, I just actually uh, did, a, did a new poem. So a new poem is on there. So feel free to check that out, guys. That's more of a creative outlet. And uh, I've been enjoying uh, posting up on there. So you can check those out if you'd like. And if you want to join the monthly ITP video conference call, you can also support the podcast on Patreon. Um, but all in all, you guys listening and watching is, is just completely good enough. So thank you for that. Thank you for tuning into the Insightful Thinkers podcast, everybody. Uh, we'll be back next week for more in-depth analysis into a diverse set of topics. Take care, everybody.